Now let's be honest, we've all done it. We've got to the end of a blank session, we've wound in our rigs, and at least one of them was tangled. Now you might be using the latest innovations in anti-tangle technology, but there's no guarantee that your rig is gonna be 100% tangle free every time. So the rig I'm gonna show you today is impossible to tangle. It'll keep you fishing no matter how good or bad the cast is, or what goes on on the lake bed, whether it's kicked around by crayfish, poisson chat, bream, tench, it doesn't matter. It's a rig that I've been testing for the last two years, flowing water, still water, massive lakes, little lakes, it doesn't matter. This rig will do it all. So the material I'm gonna to use to tie this rig is 0.50 mono. It doesn't have to be fluoro, it can just be regular bog standard mono. That's all I use for all of my fishing. Monofilament leader material makes a fantastic hook link and that is my go-to choice. Most of these materials come on 100 meter spools which makes them much better value than a 20 meter spool of fluoro. They've got very good knot strength and great abrasion resistance. My favourite hook for this rig is a straight point outturned eyed hook. You can use a beak point if you want but any outturned eyed hook will work. So to start I'm just going to pull some of this material off. I'm not going to cut it yet, I'm just going to pull myself off enough to work with. And I'm going to thread from the front, that's the front side of the eye, out the back. And I'm going to pass enough material through so that I can form a D and then cut and blob it. So that's plenty like that, so I'll pass through at four centimetres. The next thing I'm going to need is a little blowback tube. Now if you haven't got one of these you could use a bit of rig tubing, a bit of silicon tube, any, any small short section of tube will do. And all I do is thread that tube onto the mono and then hook the hook through the tube. Be very careful when you do this that you don't pierce your fingers. I tend to use my nail just to do that bit. So position the blowout tube until the top of the blowout tube is directly opposite the point. Then I'm going to make the knotless knot and I'm going to whip away from the joint of the eye so I'm going to avoid that side and go round the back. So one, two, three, four turns is all I need and I stop there. Move your fingers to pinch that bit of the knot and then I'm going to measure how much material I need. I want this hook link to be about six inches long but I need to allow enough to tie a loop on the end of it so I'm going to cut that at nine inches long about 23 centimeters and we pass that tag end from the back and exit the front so the rig looks like that so that's a little eight mil bait screw I'd use that for a single tiger nut this is a 21 mil metal bait screw which are designed for boilies I'd use that for 18 mil up to 24 mil, not a problem at all. Uh, if I was using a 15 mil boilie, I'd use a little 8 mil one. I'm making this rig up with a 20 mil boilie, so I'm going to use the 21 mil bait screw. To mount the screw, simply pass the short tag end near the hook through the loop, and then pass that tag end from the back and exit the front. At this point, what I do is I pull the loop down really tight like that and then hold that closed. Get the hook link out the way and then cut about five, seven mil and then we're gonna blob. The tag in like that. To stop you burning your finger, just wet your finger before you tap the end of the line. So that's the basic rig finished. Now, you can just tie this direct to a swivel without any problem at all. My preference is actually to tie a loop in the top and then I can quick change these rigs on and off using a quick change swivel. I'm gonna tie this with a non-slip mono loop knot because I'm very confident in the strength and capabilities of this knot. It's also a knot I've tied thousands of times. If you're more confident tying it with the figure of eight knot, then do that. 
this material is immensely strong anyway so a few percent either way on knot strength isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. To tie the non-slip mono loop knot just tie an overhand loop then you position the overhand loop about seven centimeters down from the tag end. Then we make our loop Just close that loop down a little bit so it looks like that. So we've got enough material to tie a loop there but also enough material to whip underneath the overhand knot. Now it doesn't matter which way round you go, you can go that way or you can go that way but I'm just going to go one, two, three, that's fine, plenty enough. Now this is the critical but you have to pass up that way so I'm passing through so that all of those bits of mono exit the same side so I'm exiting the same side as the loop if you go the other way this knot will not work so tie it down like that and just put your finger in the loop get to that point and then we're going to wet it to tighten it down take two pullers hook one on the hook and then hook the other on the loop wet the knot and just slowly and gently pull that down, little pulsing action. You don't have to pull it amazingly tight, this is going to be plenty strong enough. There we go. To finish all I've got to do is cut that tag end off. Now because this material is quite stiff it does not slip. If it does slip then you've tied your knot wrong. So I can cut that tag end really short so it's very very neat. The last thing you're going to need is an anti-tangle sleeve. Now I like to use these short ones because all I have to do is I take the loop that I've made there and I fold that in two and the material stiff enough and this tube is short enough so I can simply pass that material through there like that. Lots of anglers are going to be bothered about oh I, I don't want to see that knot there. Well it doesn't matter, it absolutely does not matter. The carp is not going to see that and think, oh I've seen a knot, I might kind of run away. All that matters is that that loop is long enough so that you can do that. If you've got a long anti-tangle sleeve, yeah I could have covered the whole thing, but with these little short ones it's just really quick, convenient, I don't have to mess around with the threading and it just works for me. So I've designed this rig to work with a standard quick chain swivel. Just be aware that different brands of swivel them are made differently. These ones have got this kind of uh, uh, this upturn here. Uh, I have used swivels in the past whereby you know when you actually load the hook link on it can actually get cut as you squeeze it on but these ones have got a nice run up if you like so that there's absolutely no way that the hook link can get damaged when you clip the rig on and off. Once you've hooked it on just slide the sleeve up like that and that's perfect ready to go. Then all we've got to do is mount the bait. Now I've had a few questions on social media about people that you know haven't used bait screws at all and uh, you know they worry about how, how well they hold on to the bait. Well the answer is that if you use a metal bait screw with a boilie which is the the right way of doing it they hold on to them incredibly strongly. I've had these attacked by bream and poisson chat and crayfish. Some of them it's like the I've only got back a fraction of the boilie, like a third of the boilie. It's like a cord apple almost. So what hasn't let me down is the connection between the bait screw and the boilie itself. So don't worry about losing your bait if you're using a bait screw. Just make sure that if you're using a regular bait, use a metal bait screw. Don't use a plastic bait screw, otherwise it might split it. So if you don't want to use a bait screw, then you don't have to at all. Just use a little bit of mono, use the same mono that you're using for the rig, uh, fold it in two, pass it through the material, cut and blob, and you've got a very effective way of mounting the bait on this simple rig. So here we are at the end of January, and I can see a fizzing carp on one of the spots. I baited up yesterday. He's not, he's not over the 
it's not over the bait, but all of the bait was gone. They'd cleared off the lot, and I put eight kilo in the day before. So it's an absolute myth that carp don't feed in January. If the temperature is right, they absolutely love it. So there we go. Carp feeding in January, having it. So if you haven't got any blowout tubes, what you can use is some rig tubing. But the choice of rig tubing is quite specific. If you've only got tungsten rig tubing, then that's not going to work. It's just going to split apart. But if you've got some old silicon rig tubing, then that's perfect. Just cut yourself a 5mm length, thread that onto the mono, then thread the rig tubing piece onto the hook. Great, works perfect. And it's a great way of using up old silicon rig tubing that's impossible to thread because it can do this job. If you don't have any quick change swivels or you don't want to use a quick change swivel, there's no issue whatsoever in just using a bog standard size 8 swivel. I've got a rig here ready to go and to tie this on I'm simply going to tie it on using a three turn blood knot which is plenty strong enough in this material. So through the eye of the swivel, one two, three, back through the loop next to the swivel, wet it up and just draw it down nice and neat and strong. So with only three components I've made this entire setup. We've got the 0.50 mono, off cut from a bit of rig tubing and another bit of mono to form a bait loop. So if you're happy to tie your rigs on then just slip a short anti-tangle sleeve and then you get a really nice straight connection here. Is it crazy to use a 30 pound monofilament leader material for carp fishing? Well for the last two years that's exactly what I've been doing and I've caught carp from four pounds to 48 pounds. I'm not using 30 pound hook link because I'm fishing for large carp. Carp size has got very little to do with the rated breaking strain of hook link material. I'm using this material for its thickness and it's thickness that makes it anti-eject and anti-tangle. I just love how this rig resets automatically no matter what happens whether it tangled in flight or whether the bream have been playing football with it. It does not matter this rig stays fishing for me. I know it might sound crazy but just because you're fishing for singles and doubles doesn't mean that you shouldn't use a 30 pound hook link material to do the job. What matters is that you can present consistently, cast after cast, a rig that's tangle free and remains tangle free during the fishing situation. Just because you're using a 30 pound hook link material doesn't mean you need to use 30 pound mainline above it. You can use whatever you need, 12 pound, 15 pound, 20 pound, with a leader, without a leader, it doesn't matter. Use what is appropriate for the situation. If you only want to master one rig, master this one, because really it's all you need. Well, I've got an absolute cracker to show you this morning. Possibly one of the best looking carp you'll see. It's one of our homegrown babies. Oh, you're gonna be a lively one. It's freezing cold, it's about one degrees. Can't feel my hands. And this one ripped off about 30 minutes ago. 15 hours in the water without a single beep. Taken from a, a deep silty spot near the dam wall. And I'm absolutely buzzing with him. This one fell for a, a standard trapper bait. Good mix of scopex squid, a bit of oily hemp, all just loaded in the bushwhacker, rode it out, spooned over the side exactly where I wanted it, pinpoint, accurate. All right, Charlie. And another one on a simple, uh, simple mono D, and a running rig, of course. A bite was just a simple couple of beats up to the top tip hoop round and what I was in there was no question about it just a simple straight pull take wind down connect there's game on you can't even see them are I mean people talk about barbless tearing mouths and moving around no they 
a sharp barbless goes in, stays in, absolute perfection. See you mate. Absolutely stunning. Well, I'm going to show you what's going to happen if I try and use some 15 pound 0.35 mono to do this rig. So as we can see, we've got up to that point with uh, without much issue. And I thread on a bait screw, pass that through there. I'm going to cut it the same and I'm going to give it a little blob. I'll make that blob a bit bigger. And the blob comes back and if I put any force on that bait screw at all, bunk, it disappears. You cannot use thin mono for this rig, certainly not with a size 6 Nash Shod Twister anyway. So if you've been following the channel for a couple of years you might have known that I did a D-Rig using uh, the Nash Sig Flow but I used a completely different hook and I used a completely different way of anchoring the top. So it's perfectly possible to make a D-Rig using lightweight mono but you cannot do it like I'm doing here. You must use thick heavy mono of at least 0.50 with a size 6 outturned eyed hook. So the whole point of this rig is that it's a robust anti-tangle rig. Now SIG flow is great when used in the right waters and the right way but would I take it to a big 100 acre, 100 hectare gravel pit and cast it to the moon? No, I wouldn't use it on the river either. It's just not the material for the job. You need something thick and heavy with a degree of stiffness. So you need a 0.50 leader as a minimum. So I wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison of a standard conventional D rig versus one with an elongated D. Okay, so let's have a look at a standard D rig without a blowback tube. I'm using a bait screw, so we've got a bit of separation but naturally between the top of the bait and the ring there. We've got a decent gap there as well. If you take the angle of the hook link like that, then you see that the shank of the hook is automatically canted over and that's not necessarily a bad thing so the weight of the bait is hanging off the back of the shank and I actually want the weight of the bait to be hanging off this bend this is why I've added the blowback tube so if we have a look at the version with the blowback tube the relative angle of the shank of the hook is much straighter the weight of the bait is hanging off the bend of the hook that makes the point of the hook heavier and this is exactly what we want for bottom baits because it makes the rig turn over better it's all about making the point of the hook heavy. Now, yes, you can do all sorts of tricks with having a, a weight hanging off the point here, but I just don't find any of that necessary if you get the mechanics of the rig itself right and get the weight hanging lower down off the shank of the hook before it goes round the bend. The hook holds are just much better in my experience. I have used this uh, rig. This is just a classic kind of amnesia stiff rig, really. Uh, I've certainly caught with this configuration, this, but for me, this is going to be better suited to a wafter. So if you want to use a wafter, forget about the blowback tube. And yeah, having it positioned off the back of the shank of the hook like this is great. The other way of achieving this uh, long D design, if you like, uh, is by doing a whipping knot with the mono on the shank of the hook and then going back up and through uh, uh, through the D with a knotless knot. That's great if you're really really good at tying knots uh, but the whipping knot is not easy to do just by using a simple knotless knot and the little blowback tube there cut and blob it's simple it's quick and most anglers are going to get on better with this design. So I had a very successful night last night on the running rigs and uh, I set three traps and one of them was tripped. He's an absolute chunk. I'm probably going to get the living beaten out of me, but we'll, we'll have a go at some photos and video. Okay. All right, mate. Yeah, you're big and strong, aren't you? See ya. What a result.
Uh, lots of anglers would be horrified about winding that back in with all that shot on and I get questions from customers all the time and uh, yeah, well you said it was a clean spot and it's not a clean spot look at all that shot. Well the spot that I was fishing on was absolutely clean but there is no way on earth that I am ever going to get it back at 90 metres range with a 3 ounce lead in 5 foot of water without winding through the shop because the hard spots are behind banks of silt and shod. I'm absolutely not bothered about this at all. I know it was fishing for me all night long and yeah, I'll pick that crap off and um, check the hook, probably resharpen it I expect in this case and uh, yeah new bait of course but just because it was covered in shod doesn't mean it it wasn't to, it wasn't fishing in terms of bottom types it'll fish over anything that's in front of you it'll fish over soft hard anything in between I mainly use this with bottom baits because that's what I use for 99% of my fishing most of my fishing I literally just grab a bait out of the bag and, and I go fishing. I use it a lot with uh, air dried hook baits or salt cured hook baits, uh, glugged hook baits, perfect for things like that, very very convenient with a bait screw as well. Um, but you can use it with tigers, um, you definitely can't use it with soft baits like sweet corn, anything like that. Uh, you could use it with a wafter, a little 8mm bait screw with a wafter. Uh, I don't bother with wafters myself, but if that's your bag then you can absolutely do that. I haven't used it with a pop-up, to be honest I don't use pop-ups, but you know, if you want a very, very kind of low lying pop-up then you could absolutely use it with that, not a problem. One of the reasons I use this rig so much in my fishing is that it is absolutely brilliant with a PVA stick. All you do is you make your sticks up in advance, take your rig, hook them on. It doesn't move the D on the cast. That D is absolutely fixed. It's not like a multi-rig, there's no sliding to, to do or whatever. That makes it very very quick and convenient for my fishing. Completely bomb proof. If you're a very good caster and you're looking for a rig to be you know really anti-tangle for those 130, 140 yard or 160 yard chucks if you're an absolute machine um, then this works absolutely great. Uh, completely and utterly tangle proof. There's, there's nothing to go wrong with it. You can whack it as hard as you like. It doesn't matter what the crosswinds are doing. It doesn't matter what size of the bait you're using. It's going to go out there and be presented every single time. I've literally never wound this rig in tangled. If you've only just started the foot sport or have been doing it for a few years and you know let's just say casting isn't your forte if you struggle to cast accurately if you can't feather the cast if you don't know what landing a rig is then it doesn't matter with this rig as long as it goes in the water you're fishing so if you're paranoid about your presentation then you might want to add some kind of weight to the line here now uh, this is an optional extra you do not have to do this I would use one of these tungsten oval bead, 6mm diameter and 4mm diameter I think they come in and literally just pop it on there like that and then thread it on at that point there. Put it down. If you're really paranoid about getting everything pinned down you could do something like that. So if you're fishing a rock hard really polished clean spot for very riggy fish then yeah you can go the extra mile and add a, a large tungsten sinker like that. It's certainly preferable to a big lump of putty. Uh, I have to say most of the time I do not bother doing that. So this is the rig that banked the cat yesterday and quite a few guys are commenting they're, they're worried about you know how securely bait screws hold on to boilies. So I haven't touched this at all. This was not a hardened bait. This was a straight out of the bag bait that was glugged in some glug for 24 hours, then fished with for 24 hours, and then I got a pick up. This has survived a battle behind catfish jaws for, for 25 minutes, and the bait is still there. It's still attached to the bait screw. It's obviously come under a, a severe amount of stress from the 
pads etc it's worn it away but it hasn't pulled the bait off so the bottom line is if you've never used a bait screw and you're worried about how well bait screws hold on to bottom baits the answer is really really securely as long as you use a metal bait screw with a standard boilie they hold really securely the other thing to note about this rig this is a six mil oval bead that started off there and has simply slid down there during the fight so that's not that's not how I set it up they're set up there to start with but because these are soft oval tungsten beads they don't do any damage when they get moved during the fight so I really like this feature about that product we can also see that the blowback tube has been moved up it's been pulled up that way that's not an issue at all the D has kind of been deformed I know I could you know put that out again but I'm not going to there's no way I'm going to do that because the the material has suffered a deal of damage talking of damage this is 0.50 mono this is just a standard monofilament snag leader material it survived 20 25 minutes you know connected to a really big catfish and yeah it's come on it's coming for some stick I can feel the abrasions cats have really abrasive pads and you can see the damage that it did to my finger yesterday and that was just while I was unhooking it I didn't put any force on that at all but my thumbs all raked up there and the same can be said for this hook link but it has not come anywhere near failure so you want to use monofilament for catfishing then yeah it works great just make sure that you use monofilament that's thick enough to do the job here we need 0.5 hours a minimum you might be able to get with get away with just standard 0.40 monofilament mainline all depends what you're fishing for so I wanted to show you the hook point as well this is this is a hand sharpened hook and if I just move my nail along there it gets to the end I think you can just see the end there is bent over now that way he feels very sharp but I know it's burred over that point is is done at a size 6 Nash shod twister and the amount of damage that it suffered during the battle with a very very big catfish is absolutely minimal now there's no way that I would want to reuse that hook again he's done his job he's in the bin but I know people really can't wrap their head around the fact that I use really small hooks for very very big catfish but it works great this is a really sharp hook it's gone in it's penetrated up to the bend and it's not bent it's not bent open it hasn't flexed at all because it's a really strong hook so this is one of the rigs that I use with this um, simple mono bait loop system and there's been a few comments about well how on earth can a cut and blob bait loop hold a boilie in place you know people saying that it flies off on the cast well it absolutely does not I can see that the cut and blob that I've made there is about three mil diameter so it's a three mil circle there and that's what it looks like after 24 hours in the water now it hasn't caught a fish you know I blanked on this rod but that's an out of the bag bait the bait is you know still got really good integrity in actual fact I could put that in the glug pot stick that straight back out and catch on that no problem at all I wanted to demonstrate the anti-tangle properties of this rig and, and why I came up with it what we've got here is two rigid loops both in 0.50 mono and the baits free to slide up and down there and it's free to turn but because you've got a rigid loop interacting with a rigid loop when it gets to that point there that bait can't travel further around and tangle and as soon as it comes free it untangles itself the same goes if it was down the bottom it's down the bottom and I try and turn that over to tangle the bait it can't do it because it's got restricted motion it can only go from there to there and likewise if I turn it over the other way so no matter what happens to this rig whether it's at the top bottom middle the two rigid loops make it absolutely guaranteed 
that that can't tangle. But it doesn't impede the, mo the motion. You've still got freedom of movement that way. You've even got some twist in there as well. Alright, so job one is I've got to pick one of these rigs that have been in the lug for uh, 24 hours. And just hook it onto the quick link. That's it, slide that back up the sleeve. Right, so I'm going to have a bit of a bit of a change around. I normally try and kind of split myself between three spots, but it's just not happening. So I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. I'm going to put two rods on one spot and then a third out to the out to the left. And to do that, I'm just going to put one the marker, there we go, bonk, smack, dripped on myself of course. Right, that'll do. And pop that up there. There we go. That's about a metre and a half to the right of where I would normally do it, but I'm going to put two rods to the left of that. Uh, that way I can row them out without crossing the lines. I'm still going to leave about three metres between them. I never normally fish like this, but it's the last session of the, uh, of the year for me, for the winter, and we'll just give it a whirl. Right, let's grab the lead. So I've got some rigged up baits already in the lug here, and it's simply a matter of fishing one out and clipping it on. These have been in for about 24 hours, so they've had a good soak. Loads of flavour in there. And I'm just going to leave it in the pot so it doesn't drip everywhere while I prep my bushwhacker. So we're going to knock up a mix. We've got some Scopex squid pellets and some Scopex squid flake, some 20 mil bottom baits and some oily hemp. I find an old wooden spoon is fairly handy for getting this stuff out because you don't you want to keep it wet while you're using it. If this stuff dries out, then it's no blooming good. It will just float. So nice wet hemp. I'm going to check the jar. As long as it's all covered in water, it's good. During the summer, I'd top that up with some lake water just to keep it wet. Sprinkle a Himalayan over the top and a bit of juice as well. And I simply take the rig. Lay that carefully in there, put the lead down there, and I can carry the whole lot to the boat without dripping it everywhere. Right, off we go. All the board that's coming aboard, I'm going to try and take you with me. Right, so I'm only fishing at 50 yards. Why on earth aren't I casting? Why am I using a bushwhacker? Why aren't I spotting? Why aren't I just using a PVA stick or something? It'd be far easier, right? Well, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to present a very small trap of bait. That's only about 350 grams and I want it in one spot. There's loads of little food items in there and I want to force the carp to, to grab around over a relatively small spot with a rig placed right in the middle of that. Why? Because it really, really, really works very well. It's winter. I don't want to put a load of bait out. I've got to concentrate what direction I'm going. I don't want to put a load of bait out. I want to present a very small amount of bait because I don't want to overfeed them. They're not eating much, but they are eating a little. And this is, it's like fishing with a giant PVA bag, but you know, you cannot cast a 350 gram PVA bag. Not with a three pound test curve rod anyway. So here we are, we're out at the, uh, the marker float. So this is my distance marker. Cast to 13 wraps, popped up, and the idea is I'm going to set the trap just behind and left of that. So here we are at the mark, and literally all I do is slide the trap out and empty it. And then I just navigate my way back from the marker and I'm trying to correct trying to correct the angle of the line 
once I've dropped the trap, the whole lot went over the side bait, rig, all landed in a big heap. I'm very confident of the way that uh, that stiff rig lands. That's why I use that rig, because just it can't tangle. It's never tangled in all the times I've done this, and I've done this trick a lot. So all I'm gonna do basically is line myself up back on the marker, tighten down to the lead, open the bail arm, and row back in a straight line to my swim. And that's pretty much the hardest part. When I'm rowing back, I'm paying a great deal of attention that the line is ticking off the spool nicely, because if that jams up, it's a disaster. Sometimes the spool can get dry and the line catches. If it catches and the lead moves, it's game over. Start again. The other thing I've got to watch as I come back to shore is I don't actually go over my marker rod, of course, because if I tangle up that, it'd be a dis double disaster. And now all I've got to do is straighten out the line and slip a back lead on. Now normally I'll whip that marker rod out, but like I said, I'm going to actually put two rods out on, on this spot today, just three metres apart. So I can now prep the next one and get him out, out on the money. Now, of course, to do this technique, you do not need a bushwhacker. Before I got one of those, I used to do it with a bait spoon, just screwed onto the end of a landing net pole, and it works really well. The other way that you can do it is you can row yourself out and you can apply the bait separately in a spoonful and then swing the rig into position. And that's the method I'll do for this second rock. So because I've left the marker float in position, I know exactly where the first drop was. I'm a bit too close here. I don't want them that, that close. So I'm just gonna row a little way away from that marker. I know, I know this spot very well, so I know how big it is. I'm gonna pop the rig out lay it to one side, position the spoon where I want to actually drop it, go a little way forward. Wind moves you around a lot when you're doing this sort of thing. So at the moment I'm about yeah three meters away from the first the first rod but I'm at exactly the same distance so I'm just going to spoon that over there because I'm using loose gear, get loads of oil kick off off it. And while I'm right over the spot, I simply take the rig and lower it down. Now all I have to do is reposition the boat to exit in the right direction avoid the marker float line, avoid the line from the first drop, pay attention to the line coming off the spool, know where my swim is and row back in roughly a straight line. Now you might think well that's all very well in daylight but you can't do it at night. Well actually you can. With a decent head torch, a little bit of practice perfectly possible at night. In actual fact, it's a very accurate way of fishing. So day or night, it's possible. It's very accurate, very repeatable. It's a bit tricky when it's windy. So when I'm out in open water, I need to use a marker float in order to gauge accurately my position. But if I'm fishing to a, a far margin like I am here, just rowed over to the dam wall. I just simply row over, eyeball the, the distance and the left and right from a known feature. Could be a tree. In this case, it's the corner of the sluice. And last night's pickup came from, was about nine foot, nine foot off the corner here. So that's what I'm gonna aim to do today. And I'm gonna use the method whereby I take the rig out 
put that to one side. Then I'll get into position. That's where I got the pickup. This is the time where it's really easy to smack the uh, smack the hook. Get it, get the line caught round your boot. Right, swing it out. Overswing it, swing it down, follow it down, soft thud, perfect. And all I've got to do is get back to shore. Oh my god. Well, I've never got myself in such an arse landing a fish at night. The left hander went off and came in close. Turns out there's some uh, there's some twigs tangled round the uh, round the lead. So it was like playing it on a zig because he'd come back towards me before I actually picked it up. I thought it was a liner at first, and I couldn't control this tangled mess. Tangled mess picked up my right hand rod which then dragged into my middle rod so and I've kind of had to fumble it into the net while, while connected to two other back leaded lines and uh, oh man how I landed it in the end I never know but uh, thankfully I'm just using the really sh that's the advantage we're using really short rods when something like that does happen it's easier to kind of bundle them into the net uh, just uh, very nearly ended in tears <laughs> but anyway so good news is caught another carp deep water spot that was the spot that I uh, dropped it out um, next to the uh, that's the spot next to the sluice that I dropped it earlier and uh, yeah didn't have to wait 15 hours for the pickup this time and uh, it's gone it's gone relatively quickly actually but uh, yeah all good fun here we are then, 28 pounds of very lively starburst pattern mirror. There she goes. Right, after making an absolute arse of that, I'm not going to redo the rods. It just goes to show you how important location is at this time of year. That's two bites within 12 hours from one spot and uh, Everywhere else has been absolutely dead for the last three days. So uh, just that one little, one magic spot. It's the only one doing the bites. And if you're not on it, you're not going to catch them. So I call it spot lottery. Just kind of moving traps around in order to get that, get that pick up. Um, and uh, you just got to play, play the game enough times and frequent enough to understand the patterns. So if you don't want to use bait screws and you just want to use a mono loop to mono loop connection, all you do is you cut and blob the D without having to mount a bait. We're going to do that separately. So that's it, ready to go. Then I'm going to take a bait. Then I'm just going to take some of the same 0.50 mono. And I'm going to fold over a bit of it like that. Just catch it on there, pull it tight. And we thread that through like that. Pop that out. Now at this point, we're going to take our kinked bit here. We're going to pass that through the D loop. And we're going to go back to the other side of the boilie and go next to the mono. And we're going to try and find the same hole. It doesn't matter if we miss a bit, but that's pretty close that, next to the mono there. We just put that back in the kink of the needle and just hold on to that tight. And we draw it through like that just go steady that should stay attached beautiful and pull that through till it pops out now i've looped up around the point of the hook that's no good but we'll just untangle that like that so at this point we can decide how big the loop in the bait needs to be if you make this too big then that can tangle around there like that and you know we're making an anti-tangle rig and that's the last thing we want to do so i want to make this loop quite small just a few mil small so that no matter where it goes or lands it'll always straighten itself out so I do it down to about that it'll leave the bait fairly tight to the hook but it works great to finish just take the pair of tag ends and 
cut them off two centimeters three centimeters take our lighter there we go we've got a nice singed blob there and let's take the end of the baiting needle wet that don't do this with your finger otherwise you will say ow just press that in there and as long as you've wet the end of it then the baiting needle is not going to stick to the blob so we've got a nice massive blob there that's a really really secure way of mounting that bait and the way these two loops work together you've got a big loop and a small loop this will slide around it doesn't matter where this goes it will not tangle it can be wrapped up right round there but it just shakes free every single time so I've never once had this setup come back tangled completely bomb proof